Good afternoon. All right. Um, it, it occurred to me from a couple of comments um, that people, what I don't want to do is from the t previous two messages this morning is give the opinion or the impression that I don't think wrongs should be called out. Because we know that we need to be watchmen on the wall, right? Amen. We know that. That is absolutely true. And oftentimes, uh, I guess my point is this. The way that we look at other people, <coughs> what the inner motive of the heart is, that's what I was kind of discussing, right? We, we've got to, to uh, point out wrongs when we see them. But anyway, going beyond that, uh, I'm going to also be doing a little bit of a, a recap there's going to be some points in here that I've already said, but just to bring them back to our minds. Regarding our being, who we are, God has given us some pretty amazing hardware, hasn't he? If you can think about everything that he's done for, you know, in your body, it's just absolutely incredible. The feats, the things that the human body can do on a physical level, I mean, you look at athletes, they do these incredible things, that's amazing. And all those muscles that can do all that incredible stuff and those ligaments are all made up of little tiny cells. And you put all those cells together and they make this wonderful machine. But nothing is more incredible than the mind. Um, you know, if you, I was thinking about the human mind the other day, and it's interesting to me that pretty much what your mind does is it interprets things. Because when a light bounces off an object and hits you in the eyeball, and then your brain translates that into electrical impulses, that then your brain gives you a picture. It's amazing. When you touch things, there's, your nerves are sending signals to your brain to interpret that into what you feel. I mean, just this, and sound waves interprets it into what you actually hear. It's incredible. But nothing is possibly more amazing to me than the mind's ability to what it can grasp mentally. Like, like you know, your mind was created to grasp heavenly concepts, right? <clears throat> but just like any other part of your body, what we sow, we will also what? We'll reap. Now, as amazing as that mind that we have is, it has a massive, massive problem. Its very foundation is selfish. The natural human mind is, I mean, incredible. I mean, you look out at the world and there's people, like I, I take savants. You know what a savant is? Yes. They're people that are lacking in one area of their brain, say social skills and, and those, but then they greatly excel in another part of their brain. Like they can, like I saw a video the other day of a guy that can just play anything on the piano. He hears it once and then he can just play it on the piano. There's incredible things that the mind is capable of and we obviously can't grasp all that. Some people say that your mind, uh, well, I, there's enough storage in your mind to uh, store 100 or a 1 billion volume set of encyclopedias in your brain. That's enough encyclopedias that for you to go across the country, back across the country one and a half times, I believe it is, and there's just a shelf of encyclopedias your whole trip. I mean, that's a lot of information. That's a lot of information. But as incredible as that mind is, as amazing as that hardware is, it is inherently, naturally selfish. The Bible calls it carnal. Okay? Carnal. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Romans chapter 8. Verse 7. In Romans 8, 7, the Bible reads, Because the carnal mind is what? Enmity, Enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that term, that first word that I had you read, for the carnal mind is enmity. What does enmity mean? Hostility. Yeah, it's like at war with, right? So the, the carnal human mind is at war with God. Now, it is against the very principles of the kingdom of God, because earlier I said the principles that are the, the foundational principles of the kingdom of God are selflessness. And the foundational principles of the carnal mind are selfishness. Okay? As beautiful as my little girls were when they were born, they're, they can't help but be selfish. They don't care if you're sleeping. They're hungry, right? <laughs> they don't care what they're putting you out of. They, they don't care how, how bad your headache is when you're driving in a car for hours and they're just screaming their heads off. They don't care how you feel. They care how they feel, right? <clears throat> the carnal mind is against the very principles of who God is. And what's worse, 
It always will be. Because notice that it says it is enmity against, it is enmity against God. It's not at enmity with God. There's a difference. Because if it was at enmity with God, then it could somehow be reconciled. But it's not at enmity. The carnal mind is that very enmity. So there's no hope of the carnal mind ever being in harmony with God. <clears throat> there's no hope for it to be reconciled. It is that very enmity. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you try to make your carnal mind be in harmony with God, it will not happen. It's absolutely impossible. And this isn't just a not ideal situation, because in the previous verse, it says for to be carnally minded is what? Death. death. That's pretty serious, isn't it? To be carnally minded is death. So to, to maintain the mind that you've had since you were born, that is death. Pretty serious, but it continues. It says, but to be spiritually minded, ah, is what? Life and peace. So what is required is for us to be spiritually minded. The whole reason that we're sitting here today is because we have desired to go from death unto life. And what is required for us to go from death unto life is for our mind to go from carnal to spiritual. To be instead of governed by the, by the principles of the kingdom of Satan, to be governed by the principles of the kingdom of God. Now, the thing that some people have a hard time grasping though, is that that required change, that required change of mind, is something that you cannot accomplish. Now, would you agree with me that the plan of salvation is far-reaching? You think so? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is so far-reaching that it contemplates not just a change in your actions, it contemplates a new mind being given to the believer. Now I think that some people when they think about spirituality, as, the, as far as they go, as deep as they go, it's just a change in their actions. But God does not just want to change your actions, He doesn't just want to change your thoughts, He wants to change you at the lowest level of your very nature. That's where the plan of salvation aims for, is to change you at the level of your nature. God is willing and He is able to change you in your mind. But He's not going to give you just any mind, right? We had said before that the Bible says it's the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That mind is, it is absolutely nece necessary for us to have that mind in order to be redeemed. The mind of Christ. The same mind that Christ had. Having that mind is life and peace, the Bible says, because it is subject to the law of God, and yes, indeed, it can be. It is in harmony with the principles of heaven. So if you think about man's problem, think about back in the Garden of Eden, um, from what we just read, the carnal mind is enmity against God. Because it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The law of God is selflessness. That's the, principles that are, that, that's the principle of the law. The spirit of the law is selflessness. Carnal mind is selfish. Obviously, that's not going to work. Okay? So the natural man cannot keep the law of God. So back when Adam and Eve fell, Adam and Eve were in harmony with God. When they were created, were they, created, were they born of the spirit or of the flesh, do you think? The, the spirit, right? They were in harmony with God. Their relationship with God, there was no problems. They were not, their mind was not enmity with God. They were spiritually minded. But as soon as they chose to obey Satan, they then chose another master. And the Bible says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, right? So they chose a new master. And when they chose a new master, you know what happened to their minds? They became carnal. They became carnal. And so as God comes down to meet with Adam and Eve after their transgression, just by their actions, you could see that Adam immediately blamed his wife and that whole debacle that happened. But God is looking at his children and he's saying, my children have transgressed, their natures have fallen, and they could not obey me even if they tried. Because their minds are carnal. 
in order for them to be reinstated, their minds must be changed. Their minds must be recreated. I must then, the plan that I had, that he had had from however far back, contemplated the renewal of the mind in man. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their what? Into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So pay close attention to that. He says, I am going to put my law in your mind. But remember, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that law being written in the mind, that is somebody becoming spiritually minded. The plan of salvation truly brings us into harmony with God, but only as man consents to be changed. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you refuse to be changed, you will not be in harmony with God. You know, in John chapter 3, there's, when Christ's interview with Nicodemus, Christ says, you must be born again, right? And that term is thrown around a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Being born again is thrown around a lot. But what he's telling Nicodemus is the way that you naturally are cannot be saved. He goes on to say you must be born of water and of the Spirit, right? Being born of the water, what is he referring to? Baptism, baptism right? And what's baptism a symbol of? Death. Submitting yourself to God, that old man dying. And being born of the Spirit? Remember right here being spiritually minded? It's being given a new mind. Now, Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. You know, it's interesting how I just said that in uh, Ezekiel 36, 26. Keep on going to Romans 12, 2. I'm going to read you Ezekiel 36, 26. In Ezekiel 36, 26. This is the way that I've presented it in the past. Being born of the water is obviously baptism, and we go to Romans 6 to find out what baptism means. But being born of the Spirit, in Romans 36, 26, it says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So God giving us of His Spirit makes us able to obey Him. It brings us in harmony with Him. It is that new mind. Romans 12, 2. Paul writes, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed, Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice he did not say, being transformed by the renewing of your actions. It was by the renewal of your mind. It was by the renewal of your mind. The believer is transformed not by forcing himself to be a church person. Okay? The believer is not transformed by forcing himself to live a certain lifestyle, but by the renewing of the mind. The transformation takes place from the inside out. But the error that many of us made when we came to know Christ was to try to make that transformation from the outside in. Now, the mind has habits, doesn't it? The mind has channels that it has run in your whole life. And I'm going to read you something. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to read you actually uh, a long quote. This is actually out of Review and Herald. I'm not going to read you the whole thing right at once. I'm going to break it up into several sections. And I'm going to speak uh, in between them. But this is from Review and Herald, June 12, 1888. It says, We have each of us an individual work to do, to gird up the loins of our minds, to be sober, to watch unto prayer. The mind must be firmly controlled to dwell upon subjects that will strengthen the moral powers. 
The youth should begin early to cultivate correct habits of thought. We should discipline the mind to think in a healthful channel and not permit it to dwell upon things that are evil. Now you know what girding up, girding up your loins means? It's when they had, yeah, you'd take your, uh, what they would wear, that big, whatever you would call that, I don't want to call it a dress, but they would, tunic, thank you, and they would take it and they would tie it around their waist so their legs could be mobile. And they, it meant to gird up your loins, but get ready to go to work or to go to battle, right? So girding up the loins of your mind, be vigilant, get ready for your mind to work and go to battle because there's constantly going to be, the devil's going to constantly try to get you to think in, in satanic channels, right? Now, do not allow your mind to dwell upon things that are unprofitable. The grandest themes that your mind can contemplate are the themes within the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption. If you think about how grand that is, that's the biggest thing that your mind can think about. The loftiest thoughts are there for our contemplation. Think about the unfallen universe out there. Think about the, the condescension of the Son of God to become a man, the sacrifice of the Father in allowing that to happen, the glories of the redeemed, etc., etc. There's all these things for our mind to contemplate that are just big things, and they will expand your mind. They will expand your mind. You know, it's funny because I used to be a very narrow-minded person. You know how I told you I didn't even graduate high school? I used, I used to be a real dunce. Okay? But dwelling upon the themes that are in the Bible and what God reveals to us will literally make you smarter. It will make you more intelligent. And your mind will be exercised to be able to grasp bigger and bigger things. And as you do that, gratitude will flood your soul. As you take your mind off of things of this earth and dwell upon things that are above, gratitude will flood your soul. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to do, turn from that, those lofty themes, to dwell upon things that are evil, only draws our minds from those lofty heights down to the dark miasma of the kingdom of Satan. And we don't need to do that. We can keep our minds focused on things that are holy. Going back to the quote, the psalmist exclaims, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. As God works upon the heart, by His Holy Spirit, man must cooperate with Him. The thoughts must be bound about, restricted, withdrawn from branching out and contemplating things that will only weaken and defile the soul. There are evil things that the natural mind wants to think about. Okay? There are channels that it wants to be in. And I'll give you an example. I know that I've, I spoke about criticism quite a bit, but I want to take that a little bit further. I'll be having a discussion with somebody about someone that they disagree with. Somebody that's done something that they disagree with, the church person, the leader, or whatever, right? And um, that, that leader might have done many good things in his career, but he's made some possibly spineless decisions or whatever the case might be. I, I don't know if spineless is the correct term, but you know what I'm saying. Some decisions that you really disagree with, that you think are really bad. And... Um, I'll be talking with somebody and they just, they, they, they can't say a good word about the person because they made this bad decision. And I say, well, you know, I want to expand on that a little bit because maybe the person really had a misunderstanding and he wasn't doing it on purpose to try to ruin God's people. Maybe he actually just made a really bad decision. And they will come up with excuses to try to continue the belief that that person is an evil person because they want to believe that they're evil. They want to believe it. That is a lust of the carnal mind, to want to believe evil of somebody. Okay? You should desire to want to know the best of somebody, but they want to believe what's evil. That is a lustful thought. Now, and, and plus, everything that that person ever does in the future that might be good at all, they always say, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, but... And they try to always make it sound terrible. I think that that is, uh, that is not good for us to do that. Um, I think about Cain and Abel. You know, Cain and Abel, it's interesting because Cain's mind was such that he wanted to kill someone that was righteous. What did Abel do wrong? Nothing. Abel didn't do anything wrong. But Cain's mind was in such a place where he was willing to kill a righteous man. Wanted to kill him. And I think that all of humanity is going to fall into the two categories of either Cain or Abel. Because the unrighteous tend to want to kill the righteous. 
They tend to hate him. Okay? Now, I'm going to continue this quote. The thoughts must be pure. The meditations of the heart must be clean if the words of the mouth are to be words acceptable to heaven and helpful to your associates. Christ said to the Pharisees, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's a heavy thought. I want you to think good and hard about that. By your words you'll be justified, by your words you'll be condemned. Why is it by your words? It's because your words are a revelation of the inner workings of the mind. Your words surely reveal what is going on on the inside. Now, <clears throat> speaking of the Pharisees, Christ had an interesting term for the Pharisees. He said, thou hypocrites. And that Greek word is hypocrites. I just looked in the Strong's Concordance. I'm not a Greek scholar, okay? But that word means something interesting, okay? The word hypocrites, which is where we get hypocrite, obviously, means an actor under an assumed character. It's an actor. That's what a hypocrite is. Now let me ask you, do we do that today? Do we do that today? Do we attempt to portray a different person than what the reality is on the inside. You see, you force yourself to act a certain way because this is what you want people to think of you. This is what you want to portray. All right? But you don't have to dig very deep to figure out your true motive. And your true motive is not righteousness generally, if that's the case. It's what people think of you. It's, it's selfish motive. It's self-exaltation. Now, the grand aim of the plan of salvation is to change you genuinely. You won't be an actor anymore. If the plan of salvation is allowed to work out in you, it will be genuine. The way that you act on the outside and the way that you are on the inside will be in harmony with the principles of heaven. And that's what I think is needed amongst God's people. We need to stop being actors and we need to be genuinely changed. Now, speaking of the mind, do you know where the, where the whole problem of sin began? In the mind of one. Who is that? Lucifer. Lucifer. It began in his mind. It began in his mind. I think that's very interesting. I'm going to read, um, continue reading this quote from Review and Herald. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ presented before His disciples the far-reaching principles of the law of God. He taught His hearers that the law was transgressed by the thoughts before the evil desired was carried out in actual commission. We are under obligation to control our thoughts and to bring them into subjection to the law of God. We are under obligation to God to control our thoughts. The noble powers of the mind have been given to us by the Lord that we may employ them in contemplating heavenly things. God has made abundant provision that the soul may make continual progression in the divine life. So when you talk about your mind, controlling your mind, He has made ample provision for your mind to be able to be controlled. In Revelation 14, 12 it says, Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now it's interesting, this is not just those people that try and attempt to keep the law of God. They actually keep it. They have been renewed in the mind. They are spiritually minded so that their mind and their actions are in harmony with the law of God. By renewing of their minds, they are, they, they are, they are ready to be redeemed. They are ready to be taken from this earth. The carnal mind has been crucified with Christ. Now, this is the experience that all must have, and it is well within our reach. I remember I was actually camping with somebody um, this last summer, and I was having a discussion with this. He was a friend of mine, and he's, he's older than me. He's probably in his 60s. And we were discussing 
um, he kept on talking as if it just seemed like he, he wasn't going to be ready when the Lord came back. It just seemed like righteousness was too far away. And as I discussed with him <clears throat> this topic, the renewing of the mind, by the time we were done with our conversation, he said, you know, it seems as though I had a misunderstanding because now it seems so close. It seems like it's right there. It's right there for me to grab. And he was right. The Lord revealed something to him. It's right there. I'm going to continue reading this quote. He, God, has placed on every hand agencies to aid our development in knowledge and virtue. And yet how little these agencies are appreciated or enjoyed. How often the mind is given to the contemplation of that which is earthly, sensual, and base. We give our time and thought to the trivial and commonplace things of the world and neglect the great interests that pertain to eternal life. The noble powers of the mind are dwarfed and enfeebled by lack of exercise on themes that are worthy of their concentration. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Let everyone who desires to be a partaker of the divine nature appreciate the fact that he must escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know what lust is? Selfishness. It's carnality. But there's promises in the Word of God that say you can escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's creative power that backs those promises. There must be a constant earnest struggling of the soul against the evil imaginings of the mind. Don't let the evil imaginings of your mind come out of your mouth. Because I found it too often that when a brother's talking to me about another brother or something, the evil imaginings of their mind are dribbling out on their shirt. <laughs> there must be a steadfast resistance of temptation to sin in thought or act. The soul must be kept from every stain through faith in Him who is able to keep you from falling. Now that's a fantastic promise. That's at the end of the book of Jude. Through faith in Jesus, He is able to keep you from falling. He's able. Isn't there a song, a child song? He's able. He's able. I know my Lord is able. That's absolutely true. He is able to keep your mind. Because many people hear this and think that's impossible. Having the mind be controlled is impossible. You might have ways of thinking that are ingrained. And you have entertained evil thinking until it feels like Satan has strongholds built in your mind. Okay? But turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3. For though we walk after the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Keep this in mind, the way you think is a spiritual battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Casting down what? Imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every what? Thought. To the obedience of Christ, every thought that rattles around in your brain can be brought into captivity to Christ. Every thought. Every thought that happened in Christ's mind was in obedience to the Father. Every thought. He never thought an evil thing. And that same mind can be given to you. We should meditate, I'm continuing the quote, we should meditate upon the scriptures, thinking soberly and candidly upon the things that pertain to our eternal salvation, the infinite mercy and love of Jesus, the sacrifice made in our behalf, call for most serious and solemn reflection. We should dwell upon the character of our dear Redeemer and Intercessor. We should seek to comprehend the meaning of the plan of salvation. We should meditate upon the mission of Him who came to save His people from their sins. 
By constantly contemplating heavenly themes, our faith and love will grow stronger. Our prayers will be more and more acceptable to God because they will be more and more mixed with faith and love. They will be more intelligent and fervent. There will be more constant confidence in Jesus, and you will have a daily living experience in the willingness and power of Christ to save unto the uttermost all that come unto God by Him. That is when you wrangle the thoughts in your mind. That is what happens. That's the sure result. When you exercise faith in the Son of God to bind your thoughts, use His strength to bind your thoughts, your Christian experience will grow bright. I've seen so many people walk around, walking around in our churches that their bottom lip is like hanging on the ground. You know, it's interesting to me, the, the promises that God has, and yet... We're sad. Those two things don't seem to mix to me. <clears throat> the reason why you are in church is to be changed. The whole reason. That is what you desire. It is what I desire. Lift your mind to things that are above and at every temptation to dwell upon sensual things, selfish things, self-exaltation, the faults of others, say, no, I choose to exercise faith in Christ God, you have said that every thought could be brought into captivity. And I choose to believe it, and I will walk as if it's true. And it will be a reality. Amen. Turn the mind to that which honors God. Amen. No longer will wicked things come out of your mouth because they will not be down at, in, on the inside. Amen. That is what we all desire. That is the condition we must all be in, especially at this age in earth's history. When the, Bible, when the Bible said, here they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, it was pointing to a people, right? It was pointing to a people down through the ages. Was that, was that talking about me? Was that talking about you? Are you one of that number that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Let it be said of each and every one of us that we are in that number. Amen. That when Christ comes back, we can say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him. Instead of saying to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and save us from the, faith, from the face of the Lamb. Oh, we don't want that. But it all depends. He's more than willing to do this, right? God's not holding His blessings back, saying, yeah, maybe one day I'll give it to you. No, He's saying, if you allow me to do it, I am happy to do it. Because all of the promises in Christ are yea and amen, right? Yea means what? Yes. yes and amen means let it be so. So all of the promises that God has for us, He wants to bestow on us. The problem is whether we will allow Him to do it. Whether we will allow Him to do it. We must make the choice to surrender up our old person to Him. And that reality will be manifest to the world. Manifest. Because we're a theater, right? To men and to angels. The unfallen universe looks down at us. Looks down at us to see. Just like they looked at Job. We are, Job, that story is a microcosm of the way God's people are. We are a, a testimony to what God can do. And whether God is correct or Satan is correct in the, in the plan of redemption. In the great controversy. Let God be true and every man be a liar. Let's pray together. And Father, we are grateful that, Father, their creative power stands at the back of every one of your promises. And Lord, let us leave here remembering that and to believe it and to walk as if it's true that we can be a living testimony, Father, to your goodness. Please, Father, give us safe travels where we are going. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be ready for the times that are just before us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.